Ladies and gentlemen, dear members, dear colleagues, on behalf of the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition, I bid you a good morning. I hope you, your families, friends and colleagues are well and not finding it too difficult to stay at home. Thank you very much for having registered and tuned in today for this webinar on the impact of the COVID-19 on the evolution of renewable energies within the European Union in the mid and long term, brought to you in cooperation with Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Obviously, one brief look at the power markets or energy markets in general over the past few weeks can tell just how deep this crisis goes. For energy is, of course, one of the key ingredients of added value. But what will be this crisis outcome once the lockdown is over and rescue packages will start to take effect? How durable will be its effect? In Quest for Answers, we recently had the opportunity to consult a report compiled by Bloomberg in New Energy Finance, which we found very interesting in its approach as well as in its outcomes. Indeed, we thought that this, this would be an interesting thing to share with you today and the 550 registrations we received by this morning suggest that we were not alone with this assumption. It is therefore a pleasure as well as a privilege for me to welcome two of this survey's authors, Andreas Gandolfo and Dario Traum, who will lead us through its contents and highlight some of its key findings for us. Now, before I pass over to you, some technical announcements. We are aware of the fact that this is a delicate issue and that you might have quite a few questions for our speakers. You can submit them via the chat function of the webinar plugin. We will do our best to keep at least 20 minutes for a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but that might not be enough to answer all of them. I'd like to apologize for this eventuality straight away, but Andreas, and Dario agreed that we sent them all questions after this webinar. So they might reply to some of them after all. Also, this session will be recorded. The video and the slides of this presentation will soon be available in the member section of our website. A big thank you to Bloomberg, Bloomberg New Energy Finance for agreeing to this. You shall receive a mail notifying you once the files are available for download. If you should experience difficulties with the sound or the image, my advice for you would be to shut down the webinar plugin and to relaunch it by clicking the link in the notification mail re you received this morning. One last thing before we start. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a quick questionnaire. It contains just five questions. You can skip that, of course, but if you do participate, you will help us to improve our offer. So, in a way, it is for your own good. Very well. That's all from my side for now. Andreas and Dario, please take over. Have a great webinar, everyone. Speak to you later. Thank you very much, Sven. Um, this is Dario Traum from Bloomberg Energy Finance. Guten Tag, bonjour uh, to all of the uh, participants on the OFAT side. So I had the EMEA uh, energy transition team uh, for, for BNS out of Paris, and today I'm joined by uh, my colleague, uh, Andreas Gandolfo, who is our uh, most senior power analyst uh, here in Europe. And together, uh, we're gonna walk you through our most recent uh, assessment of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the EU energy transition. Uh, but as you can expect, this is a fast moving uh, space and we're very much continuing to, to look at it. Um, before we get going with the content, just a quick uh, introduction to BNET for those of you who don't know it. Uh, we're well over 200 people uh, spread across the world. Uh, you can see our offices on this slide. And basically, uh, over the years, we've evolved into becoming a research uh, group that covers all of the energy transition. So starting with clean power, uh, we moved into transport, uh, now a lot of industry, and most recently, we're sort of venturing into the agricultural space. Uh, commodities, policies, technologies are some of the things that overlay uh, our sector analysis. And in recent weeks, uh, just in case, you know, you, some of you have other um, 
elements that you want to review from the perspective of the of the COVID-19 situation and how the, the crisis is affecting it. Uh, we've really ramped up our efforts to to cover what's happening in energy markets. So across all our offices, uh, it's really hard to keep up. Um, everyone's been really all hands on deck trying to to help our clients uh, understand what's happening. So do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions on, on other topics. But um, to get to today's topic, so just a quick overview of what we'll cover. First is our pre-COVID-19 outlook. So you know, where did we see uh, the EU energy transition go for the next decade before this happened? Then we'll look at um, a quick review of power market fundamentals because we think they're, they're basically the main driver of, of our pre-COVID-19 outlook. How the uh, crisis has affected that and then uh, I'll walk you some some policy responses also because uh, I think quite a few of you in the audience are, are involved in the policy space or at least are communicating with policymakers. So starting with the pre-COVID-19 outlook, essentially, um, unfortunately, this crisis is coming at a, quite an important time for the EU. Uh, 2020 is a year where we were essentially going to uh, review uh, the momentum we had behind our transition so far and consider whether or not um, it was time to raise ambition. So um, the EU is, is generally speaking, if you look uh, worldwide, uh, had already quite ambitious 2030 targets, but now we were uh, looking to propose um, the net zero by 2050, uh, which is uh, obviously quite a, a buzz and, and, and landmark um, objective to have, but also, and most importantly, we were trying to review the 2030 uh, ambitions. So if you look at our BAU uh, emissions curve, the existing 2030 target is already uh, quite ambitious, but um, there was hope that with the minus 55% goal uh, instead of 45 in, in 2030, uh, things would get a lot steeper and basically that there'd be quite a lot more opportunities for, for the renewable sector. Um, so what this chart shows is on one hand, you know, that the COVID-19 is might affect uh, the ambition raising prospect, but also of course that existing targets are in place and, and are not being challenged. The other thing I wanted to raise is, as often is the case in the EU, um, you know, adopting uh, union-wide objectives is often a mix of trying to get more member states to adopt uh, new targets, but also recognizing progress that has already been made. So the momentum behind uh, the ambition raising is not just happening at the Brussels level, but also at the member state level. And we actually have broadly the Western part of the EU that's already uh, in the process of committing to, to some meaningful ambitious raising. And I think this you know, was not only a trend uh, pre-COVID, but it's something that we also can rely on uh, to, to mitigate some of the current uncertainty. So packing all of this together, um, what we think is the, the main driver between this um, consideration of, of raising ambition uh, this high is that essentially, the trends in the power sector were really positive uh, on the power market economic side of things uh, before the crisis. So if you take our new energy outlook, it's our annual effort to do a least cost uh, projection for the power sector across the world. In the EU, uh, as a result of relatively flat demand and uh, decommissioning of, of aging power plants and carbon prices, we essentially expected that by 2030, on a least cost basis, the EU could already be at almost 90% zero carbon power uh, in the mix. And broadly speaking from 2040 uh, above, you know, in the 95 to 97% uh, range. It's renewables and other zero carbon. So in, in green, you of course have uh, hydro and uh, nuclear. Now, the economic drivers behind that, uh, technology cost declines uh, that auctions, corporate TPAs, but also some merchant projects are, are starting to deploy um, into the market. Show this very positive narrative, but our pre-COVID-19 outlook was also somehow uh, tempered in terms of its positivity by the fact that in reality, there's, there's quite a number of frictions in the market that are not being addressed. So uh, as, as we're speaking to a primarily French and German audience, uh, all of you will be very aware that there's some permitting and project development constraints that is slowing this capacity uh, coming online, but also on the side of decommissioning, uh, a model is uh, taking offline very quickly, a coal power plant, but the reality is that the associated socioeconomic um, challenges mean that the capacity is not coming on offline quite as fast. 
The other thing uh, worth noting is that decarbonizing the power sector is just part of the story. So if you look at this very positive picture, it actually only del it delivers less than a gigaton of CO2 emission reduction over the uh, period of 2050, which is somehow small compared to the 4.4 uh, gigatons of CO2 that the EU emitted on, in 2016. But this is only part of the story. Essentially, this heaps and heaps of zero carbon electricity we're going to produce is going to help us uh, decarbonize the other sectors. So just before uh, COVID-19 started, in, in also as part of our efforts to, to feed the discussion uh, on the 2030 ambition raising, we explored how sector coupling, so the increasing electrification of um, productive processes across our economy could help meet us, uh, meet our higher emission targets. And what this chart shows you that is essentially by leveraging uh, zero carbon electricity, you can decarbonize up to 80% almost of buildings, 55% uh, of transport by moving to uh, electric vehicles and things like that. And also a pretty sizable chunk of industry. So industry is where the, the so-called harder to abate sectors of course, some processes are not quite right to be electrified. So in a sort of realistic sector coupling scenario that could be accelerated with the sort of substantial policy ambition, we, we still see that electrification could reduce 40%. And this sort of um, drives the point around the importance of looking at power market dynamics, because if you're going to give such a big role to uh, clean power, um, it's cost and, and how well we are uh, rolling it out to the market is important. And so our electrification uh, scenario, the, the added demand that I just showed you in terms of what it means for the European power demand, we think that it could be an increase of up to 65%. So again, you know, how, at what cost you can meet that increase uh, and at what pace is very important. In terms of volumes, um, which again is sort of uh, justified a very positive uh, outlook on, on renewables for, from a European perspective, if policy goals were to be met, um, this approach of uh, higher sector coupling and faster electrification, in terms of installed capacity, we estimated that it's a multiplication of up to five times uh, the volumes of renewables and, and storage that uh, would need to be installed in a highly coupled uh, market. In putting all of this together essentially explains our key message why we thought that in terms of COVID-19 impact and, and at this time of ambition raising, really focusing on the change in power market dynamics is a really important thing if we want to understand how the situ current situation is going to impact um, the decarbonization of our economy. And secondly, that preserving the favorable uh, power market dynamics that we've seen before the crisis uh, is really important to, to essentially keep the transition at a manageable cost. So on the basis of that, um, we, and in particular Andreas, who I will soon uh, be, be giving the, the microphone to, have decided to explore scenarios on how um, the COVID-19 impact will, will uh, crisis will impact power market economics. So first, we have three uh, COVID-19 scenarios. So those are essentially different lengths and depths of the economic crisis uh, tied to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So single wave is the shortest one. That's basically that we are um, back to normal more or less by the end of the year. Multi-wave pandemic, which can be seen both at the country level, but also uh, across countries is, is a bit longer than that because, for example, you, know, you might have one economy that's um, in a good place, but then actually one of its important trading partners is going through uh, a pandemic and you sort of have these ripple effects. So that would be a multi-wave. And then enduring pandemic, lower for longer, this is a depression uh, where essentially GDP doesn't recover uh, for some time and, and economic growth is taken off course. And for those three scenarios, um, we've essentially matched them with three um, positive, neutral, negative policy responses from an energy transition perspective. So in each case, what would happen if policymakers take a positive stance um, on, on renewables, try to make it, for example, part of the, of the recovery and stimulus packages, well, on the country, if the financial distress and the um, dire economic situations our country are, are in justifies shifting our attention away from climate, away from renewables, in favor of uh, measures that are uh, more profitable to other sectors of the economy. 
thankfully today we will not uh, go through all nine of those scenarios those are part of the, the notes uh, that uh, Sven uh, referred to but we'll actually focus on uh, two and eight here on this slide which is you know we're quite comfortable that multi-wave is is where we're heading at least like single wave is, is unlikely in terms of length at least uh, and in this case we thought it's most interesting to look at um, the positive uh, and the negative uh, potential policy responses um, so that's it from me for now and I'm gonna pass it to, to Andreas to walk you through, um, first of all, the, the power market um, dynamics, fundamentals. Thank you, Dario. Uh, thank you to everyone who's tuning in today and to the webinar organizers for having us here today. Uh, now that you have an idea of the path we were on before COVID-19, I want to show you how the crisis in combination with policy response can determine our trajectory once all of this is over. In order to streamline the present, uh, sorry, uh, in, um, yes. Uh, before I begin, though, I want to lay some foundations by explaining the implications of two key cost comparisons that define power markets. The first comparison is between the short term marginal cost of an existing coal and gas plant, shown in this chart. In the period highlighted, you see that the cost of running coal, the black line, is lower than that of running gas, the gray line. As a result, during this period, we see more coal burn for electricity generation and consequently higher emissions. In the period highlighted now, the dynamic reverses with gas becoming cheaper than coal. As a result, during this period, we see more gas burn for electricity generation, which results in, rel in relatively lower emissions. One thing you need to keep in mind about this cost comparison is that its effects on the market are not permanent, at least not in the short to medium term. As such, every time the two curves cross, we see an almost immediate switch in the preferred fuel for electricity generation. For decarbonization, this can be good and bad. It is good because making gas cheaper than coal can have immediate effects. At the same time, it is bad because of its volatile nature and its exposure to shocks like the COVID-19 crisis. The main reason why this dynamic is volatile is its direct link to the price of three commodities, coal, gas, and carbon. The first two are beyond the control of individual players as they follow global supply and demand balances. Carbon, the third and last commodity, is in the control of policymakers to try to determine the optimal CO2 supply to achieve a target. However, carbon can also fall victim to politics as it has the tendency to make electricity pricier, especially when generated with coal. Now that we have understood the first cost comparison and the fundamental drivers behind it, let me move on to the second one. Just like before, I'm showing you the running cost of an existing coal or gas plant. However, this time, we compare it to the levelized cost of electricity, or LCOE, of building a new renewable asset represented by the blue line on the chart. A small parenthesis here about the LCOE. This metric amortizes all the costs of a new build project over the energy such project will generate in its lifetime, allowing the comparison between technologies that on the face of it might have very different costs and energy use. When it comes to this dynamic, it no longer makes sense to talk about periods. Instead, we look at the moment when building a new renewable project becomes cheaper than running an existing coal or gas plant. When we reach this point, we find that the level of policy support needed to drive renewable build, often in the form of subsidies, goes down significantly. That is because revenues from the power market are enough to satisfy investors. Instead, policy support becomes more of a hedge against uncertainty rather than an actual leg up. As new renewable projects come online, the reduction in emissions becomes permanent. The reason behind that has to do with the fact that most of the costs of building a wind or solar project lie in the equipment and construction thereof. As the operating costs are almost negligible and definitely a lot less than those of coal and gas, the owner of the renewable asset is incentivized to sell as much energy as possible in order to recoup the initial investment. This means that even if in the future new renewable projects are no longer cheaper than coal and gas, the ones that are already built will continue operating as usual, permanently eating into the share of generation captured by fossil fuels. Just like with the previous cost comparison, commodities continue to play an important role in determining when this crossover point occurs. 
However, to that we need to add two more parameters, namely technology and financing costs for renewables. As we will see later, technology costs follow global multi-year trends that are hard to append. Financing costs, on the other hand, are affected by a series of global, local and policy determinants and can mean the difference between renewable projects becoming viable next year or the end of the 2020s. Having defined the key market dynamics we care about, we can now move on to look at how they might change. Any analysis on this needs to start by looking at how the value of the five fundamental drivers identified at the end of the previous section my change as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. I will start by looking at the commodities. Beginning with carbon prices for three reasons. First, because of their link to Europe's economic fundamentals. Second, because of their link to the continent's politics. And third, because of the volatility this commodity has already exhibited as a result of its relationship to economics and politics. In this chart, you see the daily EU ETS price in Europe over 2020, up until the day Italy went on lockdown. As you can tell, prices remained relatively stable at around 25 euros per tonne of CO2. Then, in a matter of a couple of weeks, CO2 prices lost around 40% of their value. Strict lockdowns made it clear to everyone that there were going to be widespread economic consequences from the COVID-19 crisis. As economic activity and emissions are positively correlated, the lockdown sent European carbon prices spiraling down. As the dust from the initial sell off settled, carbon prices recovered to around 21 euros per tonne of CO2 at the end of a couple of weeks ago. Yet carbon prices remain one important announcement away from returning to their previous highs or falling to their lowest lows. This fact is reflected in the wide range of possible price outlooks that PNF has identified. At the lower end of the spectrum, we find prices in line with those of the post-2009-10 to financial crisis. These could be the result of a severe economic downturn and thus reduction in emissions combined with little appetite to prop up carbon prices and maybe even an inclination to weaken them. At the higher end of the spectrum, we find prices almost in line with our pre-crisis outlook a combination of positive post-crisis economic outcomes for Europe and policy that supports carbon prices push us towards this trend. Luckily for policymakers, the current expected trajectory of coal and gas prices suggests that a middle ground exists which can satisfy both people with higher climate ambition and those who might want to prioritize economic recovery over sustainability. This price rests at 16 euros per tonne of CO2, lower than the current one, and is enough to keep gas as the cheaper fossil fuel option. However, it is important to stress that at this level, carbon prices would leave little, little wiggle room for changes in coal and gas prices. The topic of the coming slides. First up, coal, which at the start of the COVID-19 crisis was at historical lows. Uncertainty around the crisis outcomes has fed through to coal prices, which have moved between 40 and 50 euros per tonne, as the market adjusts to expectations about coal consumption in China and India. The forward price curve before Europe went on lockdown showed coal prices recovering in the coming years to reach 65 euros per tonne by 2025. When we compare the pre-lockdown forward curve to the post-lockdown one, we find that the market's expectations have been little affected by developments in Europe, an expected outcome once Europe's position as a consumer of global coal is taken into consideration. For gas prices, the story is slightly different to coal. In 2020, European gas prices continued their downward trend, losing almost half of their value. A big share of that price drop came before the COVID-19 crisis hit the continent, on the back of a windy winter with mild temperatures, which drove gas demand down. We also find that the market expected gas prices to recover to around 18 euros per megawatt hour by 2025, before Italy went on lockdown. When we look at the same forward curve post lockdown, we find that the outlook has not changed significantly, with COVID-19 leading to a mere 5% drop in future expectations. Now that we have a view on commodity prices, I'm going to shift our attention to renewable costs with an emphasis on financing and technology. In these two charts, I'm showing you BNF's outlook for new build wind and solar LCOEs in Germany and the UK. A combination of factors drive these down over time, 
most of which are directly attributable to technology improvements. And while these improvements are important for future competitiveness of these two technologies, they're not under threat from the COVID-19 crisis. The main reason for that is the time scale over which these improvements happen. As I'm showing you in this chart, the decline in the cost of wind turbines has been a steady multi-decade process. Temporary ups and downs reflect conditions in the moment, but do not take away from the overall downward trend. As such, any changes during the current crisis are likely to pro prove a small hiccup rather than a permanent dent. There is, however, another cost component that can shift the curves shown here. In this chart, I have broken down the different costs for new build, solar, wind, gas, and coal projects. As you can see in the highlighted area, financing costs can make up more than 50% of project costs when it comes to wind and solar technologies. This makes subsidy or revenue sub uh, stabilization mechanisms key. By lowering project risk, project developers can tap cheaper funds and increase debt ratios. In Europe, it is exactly such mechanisms that have helped financing costs for renewables come down, come down over the past decade. Due to the importance of financing costs, even a small change in the order of 1 to 2% can shift the entire curve up or down by 14 to 18%. This brings us to the conclusion that when it comes to the fundamental building blocks of European power markets, carbon prices and financing costs are both most at risk from the COVID-19 crisis and the most likely to determine the trajectory for Europe's power sector after the crisis. Instead, coal, gas and technology costs are underpinned by long-term trends that, at least for now, do not, appear, do not appear to be a threat. Now that we have seen how the fundamentals might change, let's shift our attention back to the key power market dynamics and our scenarios. First up, the negative policy response scenario. Before I start with any analysis, I want to show you BNIP's complete pre-crisis view. As this chart shows, up until a few months ago, we expected gas to remain cheaper than coal for the coming years. We also expected renewables to reach the crossover point with fossil fuels sometime between 2021 and 2023. However, a negative response by policymakers could see carbon prices crash to the bottom of the range I showed you earlier. This would bring fossil fuel running costs down by 50% and make coal cheaper than gas once again. At the same time, if policymakers decide to stop all future support for renewables or even scrap past schemes, investors might abandon the industry as it no longer yields the safe returns they hope for. Combined with the fact that non-subsidized projects are no longer viable and that an economic crisis is likely to boost aversion to risk, renewable LCOEs could jump by 8%. The combination of these decisions could result in Europe having no coal to gas fuel switching and no fossil fuel to renewable switching before 2023. This presents a significant deviation from a pre-crisis trajectory and one which would have multiple repercussions, such as a slowdown or even stop of the continent's energy transition with more coal around for longer and a high likelihood that the 2030 targets would be missed. Now let's see what happens if under the same economic circumstances, policymakers take a stance that is favorable to the energy transition. Skipping the pre-crisis starting point, which remains the same in both cases, we see that if policymakers take as much action as possible to keep carbon prices on their pre-crisis trajectory, the running costs of fossil fuels fall by a mere 10%. Most importantly, the key dynamic of having cheaper gas than coal is preserved for the coming years. At the same time, a push to build more renewables, primarily in the form of increased revenue support schemes such as subsidies, creates a desirable asset class for investors. Attracted by yields and safety, financiers lower the cost of capital for renewables, lowering the LCOE. As unsubsidized projects become viable, even more money flows to the industry, resulting in an average LCOE drop of 13% from the pre-crisis trajectory. The combination of these two dynamics results in a coal to gas fuel switching remaining the same uh, as when compared to the pre-crisis level. For renewables, the crossover with fossil fuels comes by 2020 to 2021. This represents a significant improvement on our pre-crisis scenario as renewables become competitive a couple of years earlier. However, the long-term effects cannot be understated 
as this new trajectory can lower the overall cost of the transition and ever less need for governments to intervene either to deliver new wind or solar capacity or to drive existing coal capacity offline. All of this combined would not only contribute to Europe's exit from a recession, but would set the bloc on course to meet its 2030 targets. And now I will hand over back to Dario with some policy implications. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for this uh, thorough uh, go through all the all the different scenario work we've done. Um, just because of sort of the amount of, of news headlines we've seen uh, calling for grand green stimulus and and how essentially the transition should be a response uh, first out of this crisis, we sort of had a quick uh, qualitative discussion uh, around what the implications of that might be. And, and essentially, you know, one of the reasons why we proceeded with CARE is that we're very well aware that in the short term, uh, government finance are very much under stress just to keep people um, in their jobs, so particularly in Europe, where, where a lot of the, the wages and, and unemployment compensations are, are being taken on by, by government. So that probably means that the uh, budget for green uh, recovery is, is somehow limited to what we already had perhaps or, or might be even less so um trying to take a sober approach here but uh, definitely open to to the conversation after um and hear other suggestions so you know the first thing for us was about safeguarding uh favorable power market dynamics the ones we, we described before and in the renewable space you know we're at a time where uh, Member states were finalizing their 2030 uh, NECPs. This is very much a signal that's uh, waited for uh, across the industry. Um, in the vast majority of cases for big uh, markets, those were targeting double digit uh, growth for the renewable sector. Uh, one of the things that you know the commission and, and in general uh, policymakers should be mindful of is that, that the COVID-19 crisis might make it more difficult to, to see ambition raising in, in the member states that weren't as ambitious in the drafts, but uh, that hasn't really changed from, from pre-COVID. So really for renewables, given uh, how favorable um, the technology cost trend was, we really think it's about improving development conditions. So addressing some of the issues there has been around permitting and then ensuring that there is a healthy uh, pipeline of auction opportunities uh, there. So. Fundamentally, we think it's a pretty low political and financial cost, but something that's needed uh, anyway, COVID or, or, or not. On carbon, it's more complicated. So um, thankfully, we've seen the, the carbon price somehow uh, stabilize around the, a place where fuel switching is happening. But you know, it, this is really fundamental to uh, reducing emissions in our power sector. Uh, last year was a record year for uh, emission reductions in EU power, and that is really because uh, fuel switching kicked in, uh, not just because of renewables deployment. So, you know, if carbon prices were to bottom out, it's urgent uh, to consider whether or not adjustment to the uh, market stability reserves would help keeping them at a level that is um, that is conducive to the carbonization of the power sector. But also, considering how comfortable, I would say, uh, the vast majority of power sector stakeholders are with um, carbon prices being in fuel switching territory. Um, member states may decide to, to introduce a carbon price for, for the power sector specifically if EU level action um, is, is made too complicated by opposition of, of certain member states. So, you know, this we really think is it's all about safeguarding the strongest driver of, of emission reductions and, and definitely has some political challenges at the EU level, but is a relatively mature uh, policy conversation, at least as a, even at the national level, from a carbon price flow perspective. And then the third one in these sort of top three, uh, we think it's worth focusing on is, of course, energy efficiency, because of all the investments you can do in, uh, in an accelerated transition. This is probably the most jobs intense one. Um, a lot of the communities that are most impacted by this crisis uh, in low income groups are probably also um, particularly aware of the difficult uh, living conditions they are in now if their, if their homes are, are not energy efficient and, and, and what other problems you have with the inside Uber uh, buildings. So from an uh, economic, social and environmental returns perspective, we think that that's, that's something that the Commission and the Member States should prioritize because the rate of efficiency we're, we're reaching is, is really has been consistently behind for the last 20 years. So if, if there should be an added effort and, and a leverage of substantial amount of, of money 
um, you know, this is an area to explore and also to create uh, new business models that are positive for all actors in the, in the sector, including uh, utilities and, and energy companies. And then um, the second page is, is a little bit more, a um, little bit lower on the priority list from our perspective. I mean, one is uh, for the fuel power plants, um, there may be some temptation in, in countries with lower, lower demand uh, to try to save or shore up the finances of, of assets that are uh, not needed to, to do grid, uh, in particular coal power plants. Uh, this is, in our view, always um, a bad decision. But one thing that makes the current context special is, of course, um, the argument that there may be a rebound in demand and that we, you know, we shouldn't let all of the capacity that's not utilized today uh, go offline, and, and, and that's absolutely fair. So wherever um, support to uh, in the form of capacity payment, for example, is awarded to, to keep capacity on, online, in particular if it's to coal plants, I think it's very important to include the conditionality of, of those being temporary. And typically, you know, this might be a good time to identify the oldest um, coal assets that are ready to go next, put them into reserve a little bit like what Germany has done, and then uh, force them out of the market permanently if, if demand doesn't recover to the level or, or if renewables replaces that load. On the transport sector, so you, you've seen earlier that, that we're very bullish about electrification uh, of transport. Um, car companies are in a tricky place, of course, because they, they just invest billions on transforming uh, to, to be able to supply more EVs right at a time where car sales are now, uh, absolutely at the bottom. So we know that this is going to be a very uh, intense discussion between um, the government and the sector on, on what sort of uh, bailouts are needed, where they are needed, if needed. But fundamentally, we think you know this would be best served by demand side incentives. So in the previous economic crisis, we had scrappage schemes and, and purchase incentives for cleaner vehicles, not yet EVs. Um, you know, this could be a really good time to, to accelerate uh, support to these measures. And then wherever there is an increased focus on, on smart charging, uh, on charging infrastructure, uh, which fundamentally, you know, we don't think is particularly additive in the short term from a crisis response perspective, but, but still helps the transition in the long term, uh, those should be smart charges um, so that they can help better integrate, leverage cars to integrate more renewables. And lastly is sort of the next generation decarbonization technologies. Uh, Germany, France, and, and soon the EU have just all announced their the hydrogen strategies. It's a big part of the Green Deal, and you know, and, and we're we're very bullish, and we've done a extensive research that we just finished on the role of hydrogen and the low carbon economy, in particular, uh, from 2030 onwards. And I think that's the important message here: is um, from a political narrative perspective, if you're trying to um, announce a response to a, a very immediate and short-term crisis, um, you know, saying that you're going to invest more billions into hydrogen is probably not going to be, um, you know, connect very well with the hardship that um, that people are seeing day to day. So we're very positive on, on next generation technologies. We just don't think that they have a big role to play in the in the crisis response in the in the near term. So this, that's it for for us for the presentation today. Thank you very much for for listening to it. It's it's quite a long one, uh, and and I think we would be open to take some some questions for the uh, rest of the, the time we have. Yeah, thank you very much, Dario and uh, Andrea, for this very interesting insight in uh, your findings, um, your analysis of um, <clears throat> the, the the outcomes of the of the results of the, uh, the ongoing crisis in the mid and long term. Um, and thank you very much to our audience um, because I see your questions are coming in. So. Um, uh, that's great. We will spend the rest of the time that we have uh, in with, uh, with answering them. Um, a first, let's say, cluster uh, of question is obviously uh, structured around the, the, the ETS, um, which will play a key role, as far as I understand, from what you are saying. Um, the first thing is um, people say you didn't include nuclear, which is uh, obviously a very uh, French um, analysis. Um, is that deliberately so, or did you uh, uh, think that nuclear is quite comparable to uh, renewable energies as a, um, as a low carbon technology? Or uh, what is the reason for not including it? 
And how would you say does um, the current situation impact the perspectives for nuclear power in Europe in the future? So, I mean, maybe starting and, and Andreas can complete. Um, the SUE analysis was very much comparing new build renewables versus existing fossil fuels. So there is essentially the opportunity for you know, new clean energy to displace uh, existing emitting one. And you know, as our, our French uh, colleagues online will, will be aware, uh, new build nuclear um, isn't particularly uh, doing well when we put it on a, a cost curve. Uh, if we take our latest reference point, it's, uh, it's Hinkley in, in the UK. So um, in our least cost decarbonization uh, model that you saw at the very beginning of the presentation, uh, new nuclear actually does not uh, capture any of that opportunity as a result of because it's just not the least cost solution it's building more renewables uh, with storage and, and flexibility in the grid is is more attractive now that's because we focused on a least cost approach rather than an industrial um, strategy and of course um, one could consider whether or not in a, you know if the government was to mobilize substantial amounts of public money um, you know that could go in favor of um, of new nuclear uh, plants, um, given that there is some some plan potentially in the coming years in France. Um, there's a question whether or not you want to integrate that in the the response uh, discussion. But um, let's say you know it, it just wasn't our perspective focusing on, on least cost um, in this uh, in this context. Okay. Um, one thing um, that also emerged from uh, from your uh, questions, uh, uh, from your from your presentation, the questions that we received, is um, the question of if we remain uh, in the context of the ETS, um, if let's say a policy response that you would describe as, as positive in Europe uh, would lift that uh, the, the the price on the ETS. Uh, would you consider that uh, the border tax will become uh, again uh, a topic to look at, uh, or um, do you think that um, the, the European uh, system is uh, sufficient in itself to uh, to maintain a high ETS price without losing too much uh, generation capacity to uh, to the non-EU um, countries? So maybe on the um, carbon border adjustment tax first and then um, Andreas if you want to complete on the um, on the generation and, and bits. Um, you know this is obviously extremely sensible a uh, sensitive sorry um, discussion um, from a you know we, we are in a context where um, World Trade Organization rules are being challenged at all times and, and trade retaliation uh, is uh, becoming a, a feature of our daily news reading. Um, but we see you know the carbon border adjustment tax discussion is extremely important for the objectives of the Green Deal. Uh, we think as soon as you start to, you know, if you look at the 2030 target that we mentioned, and I showed you how little the power section of all of our emissions is, um, if you get to meaningful um, decarbonization across industry, you also need to correct uh, and, and avoid carbon leakage, potentially through a carbon uh, border tax at the, at the border. But there's other mechanisms, you know, whether you do something comprehensive or that is industry specific or commodity specific is, is obviously still very much going to be a lively debate for the for the coming years. Now, when it comes to the power sector specifically, um, and I think Andreas, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, there the it, we have an EU wide uh, ETS and we have a little bit of leakage happening to our limited uh, connections in towards Russia. Uh, but also towards Morocco, um, you know, it's more of an issue um, for the peripheral, uh, the markets that are directly connected to our, our neighboring countries, but overall EU-wide, uh, Germany, for example, or France, or, or our overall mix is relatively insulated from the high carbon generation that you would find in, in Russia. It's, it's more an issue for the utilities that are active in Lithuania or uh, in the case of, of Spain, we've been importing a bit of coal. It's, it's an issue for Spain, but it's not you know, if, if we 
support um, the EU carbon uh, price for, from a power perspective, you're not suddenly going to see the DF lose market share to uh, electricity demand. Maybe to that, I will add that um, the, the, the carbon price, at least when it comes to power, um, <coughs> it's also incentivizing a new build renewables, as we saw earlier. Um, it's essentially uh, making power prices higher, such that new build renewables come in. And in fact, when you got when you get new build renewables coming in, then during uh, high wind or solar periods, actually these markets become a lot cheaper. And, and if you have an excess, then you also start exporting um, to these countries. So, uh, you know, it, it's not a higher carbon price, then we will have a more expensive coal or gas fleet. And so we will import dirty or far from there, but it's also, it, if it's driving new capacity build, then you actually have the benefit that uh, you counteract that by actually exporting a lot more clean power um, outwards. And a lot of people say, okay, this is not yet happening. And, and, and it's true that the short term effects of any such measure uh, will be uh, a painful or like worse for decarbonization. Probably I think that the UK has experienced with its carbon price floor essentially importing coal power uh, from continental Europe. But if you look at the medium term, um, if that results in more capacity build, then you have periods when, for example, the UK could be exporting uh, wind power outwards. Okay. That leads us to uh, to another set of questions I received. Um, the volatility of uh, of uh, some renewable energy sources, of course, um, and its impact on the system. Um, do you see? Well, you you spoke about uh, decarbonization or future decarbonization uh, technologies, um, and you mentioned uh, um, hydrogen, for example. But what about, let's say, more Technologies that we see today already uh, in service, like uh, like storage uh, technologies, like battery storage, um, maybe even um, uh, pumped um, hydropower. Uh, would you see that there will be um, the, the 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 impact on the cost of the of the global system? Um, uh, will that uh, lead to uh, an increased um, support of power instead of energy, for example, or to uh, to, to a growing investment into uh, flexibility options? How would you rate that? So there are there are you know pe people uh, talk about storage and uh, especially pumped hydro and batteries, and I think. The conversation we need to have there is uh, twofold. Um, the first, you know, batteries and pumped hydro can do two things. One is pretty much offer grid stability on what we call very, very brief periods, right? So you have a wind picks up uh, or, or essentially wind fluctuates uh, from second to second and wind and uh, batteries and pumped hydro are very good at, at absorbing those fluctuations, especially batteries, but, but also uh, pumped hydro. Um, this is something some other technologies can do. And so there you create a bit of a space, an economic space that um, essentially as wind and solar grow, uh, you, you have a market for these uh, kind of like secondary services uh, that, that are meant to like keep the balance uh, to the point where you have no blackouts. The second part of the discussion obviously is, is what we call like actual storage. So you have excess wind or you have excess uh, solar and now you wanna put it somewhere and, and uh, use it later. That uh, in our outlooks, no matter what comes later, it comes in the 2030s. Uh, and in fact, it most often comes with solar rather than with wind. Uh, wind profiles tend to be um, distributed enough such that um, you know the, the actual storage that you might need might be intra-seasonal, um, which is a at the moment we, we're not including because like our, our assumptions on the types of intra-seasonal storage are going to determine too much of the outcome. There's just not one technology right now that can offer 
viable interseason storage. And in fact, if you look at our numbers, it's gas that's doing that job of interseasonal uh, balancing. Uh, however, with, with solar, you have this thing where you can have an excess generation in the middle of the day and then shift it uh, in the afternoon. In those periods, we obviously see uh, batteries becoming viable economically. Um, about pumped hydro, a lot of people ask me, the problem with pumped hydro is that even if I have the best cost projection, um, I can't go around and build pumped hydro uncontrolled uh, around Europe because it's a very site-specific uh, technology. So I need to know what sites are available, if we use them up, are more going to become available? Uh, and so even if we put a, a cost at, let's say, some people tell me oh, it's pumped hydro is more competitive than batteries. Yes, but it's more competitive when you have a specific site with some specific characteristic, while a battery is a technology that I can model or we can model more uh, abstractly. You know, they come in a container essentially and you can place them here or there uh, right. and, and it doesn't make a big difference. Okay, and um, just um, maybe one um, one thing to make things clear for for the audience. <clears throat> you um, when you mentioned the future decarbonization technologies, you said that they are not uh, economically viable yet. Uh, hydrogen, for example, you see many countries are moving into that direction. Uh, where would you say, with what uh, horizon do you think um, can people work? When will this start to become um, viable to work with? So um, I, I recommend um, everyone who is interested in hydrogen to, to take a look at, um, we have actually a public, um, we make quite a bit of our hydrogen research a public because of the last year, a group of, of analysts across the world made a big, big effort. Um, to review the potential of hydrogen, and I mean, you know, one one first positive signal that came is is as often as the case when you look at um, fleet technology, you scratch a bit under the surface and you find out that in China somebody is making uh, electrolyzers 90% cheaper than um, what what Western benchmarks uh, are assuming. So the good news is it's probably going to be uh, cheaper, faster than we had anticipated a little bit. Um, like the, the PV industry before that, um, obviously this has implications for governments who, who want to um, not be relying entirely on, on imports from, from um, cheaper manufacturing locations. Now, on the potential applications, so, so I mean, first you have the cost of producing, the electrolyzers are cheaper than anticipated, renewables cost is coming down. Then you have the cost of transport. On the, that side, I think there is a lot of, um, Sort of not particularly good uh, information out there that sort of doesn't recognize the difficulty and the high cost of uh, transporting hydrogen over long distances. In particular, in Europe, there's a lot of uh, discussions uh, that are uh, not transparent about the fact that you know the, the revival of desert tech, uh, producing lots of renewables in the desert to turn it into hydrogen and send it through pipelines to Europe um, adds an immense cost. To, um, the production of hydrogen, so we don't really see much much value in that. But assuming all of these things, putting them together, where we see a lot of opportunities actually producing hydrogen in places where you have both demand, so typically an industrial cluster, next to uh, high renewables uh, resources. So for example, one of the first places that you're seeing some quasi uh, market competitive uh, hydrogen applications is refineries that use uh, hydrogen in their um, in their refining process that are on the coast and that have an offshore wind farm uh, next to them. You know that's a really attractive combination. And so, in a few industries, and in, in taking these clusters and taking these geographic uh, parameters, you know we see that in Europe, in the 2030s, sometime using hydrogen, um, thanks to a small uh, carbon price premium can allow you to produce, for example, clean uh, steel that is competitive or comparable to the price of producing uh, steel with existing fossil fuels. So that means that, you know, in short, uh, from the 2030s, we see market application, but also, of course, it means that it is very uh, positive that the government strategies are being worked on now, because if we want to be able to do something that is you know, market comparable in the 2030s, now is the time to to figure out the business models and the regulations and the incentives that are needed to take it. Okay, 
All right. Something that has a very direct link uh, to that question, I guess, <clears throat> and something you mentioned also in your um, in your presentation is, um, <clears throat> of course, um, how the um, how the consumption will evolve over the coming years. Um, would you say that a mid and long term low electricity price will accelerate um, the sectoral inter integration of um, the energy system so that, uh, let's say, the electrification of heat and uh, mobility uh, will, uh, will accelerate, which would obviously also provide a potential of flexibility to the power system? Yeah, I think Andreas will uh, will complete me. I mean, one of the messages that I said at the beginning uh, is, you know, favorable power market economics are fundamental to the costs of the transition of making it financially uh, viable for for our economies. So my general response to that is yes, you know, um, the fact that renewables are cheap uh, and that they produce, we're going to have a lot of excess power is really central to the electrification narrative and and perhaps anecdotally. Uh, I'll just highlight that uh, some of our colleagues who are users of Octopus Energy as a retail electricity provider in the UK uh, have actually been paid to uh, use their electricity over the last couple of days as a result of low demand. Um, and you know, this this is how these periods of, of sudden demand drops and, and shock periods are giving us a little bit of a, of a, of a window into the future. But um, I'll, I'll let uh, Andreas pick it up from here because I think he'll probably have a view more on the on the power market dynamics there. So um, this is a question that we've been spending quite some time thinking about and um, probably a, a very good example where cheaper electricity won't help is uh, electric vehicles, I would say, because uh, when essentially you look at the portion of electricity consumption to run an electric vehicle compared to the cost of it, it's clear that um, you know, while for an internal combustion engine, it's, you know, all about fuel, fuel, fuel. Uh, on an electric vehicle, it's all about the initial investment. And so I think the the part of the question will be, uh, what's the initial investment compared to the running cost? Um, that is a bit kind of saying like, okay, maybe cheap power it doesn't necessarily mean uh, uh, more electricity demand. However, uh, there is the other part of the the, the the question, which is, you know, we really don't know what will happen with uh, cheap power. Um, and in fact, today people might be thinking about highly efficient machines um, that use electricity to convert it to other forms of um, of uh, uh, work or of energy. But in fact, in the future, we might see. Um, people opting to electrify with cheap, inefficient uh, technologies because the electricity is so cheap. And, and you know, if you're getting power at 20 cents per, uh, sorry, uh, two cents per uh, kilowatt hour, 20 euros per megawatt hour, uh, you know, you might essentially say, who cares if uh, our machine wastes 30 or 40 percent of that energy, the equipment to build it is, is so much cheaper. And so I would say, there, you know, while right now, if I look around me, I, I see equipment that when once converted to electricity, it's the upfront cost that that, that drives the, the decision and not so much the use cost. Um, going forward, there's nothing saying that we might not see more industry um, convert to electricity with less efficient, cheaper processes, simply because of how cheap uh, electricity can be. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think we, well, we, we are running out of time a little bit. Um, so I think we will, we will come to the end, unfortunately, already. Thank you very much, um, Dario and Andreas, for this very interesting uh, insight into your work and uh, for answering um, the audience uh, questions. Um, and yeah. also, big thanks to Celine and Marie for uh, the technical support today. Uh, yes, we're coming to the end. Before we sign off, just a few announcements. Do take a look at our upcoming conferences on our website. All of them shall be held online until the summer, so you can register on our website. 
um, which is the French one, OFATE.EU. So that's O F A T E dot EU. And the German version is D F B E W dot EU. D F B E W dot EU. And uh, you will also find there quite a few uh, interesting uh, papers we, uh, we have been uh, writing for you uh, over the past uh, months and years. Um, and I'm sure that they will help you to get through this lockdown uh, without being too bored. Um, upcoming uh, conferences are scheduled already uh, on May 22nd, uh, uh, ground mounted TV plans uh, between price and land use. June 9th, sectoral integration. So we were talking about uh, uh, what we have uh, just been discussing about uh, sectoral integration of the energy system, flexibilization, decarbonization, and electrification. June 18th, TV plans, uh, post support scheme, operation, deconstruction, and recycling. And on June 30th, building renovation and energy efficiency. We are also preparing a new series of webinars on a large variety of topics. So make sure you're on a mailing list to receive our updates on that. And uh, that's all for today from my side. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks again, Andrea and uh, Dario. And uh, yeah, please stay safe. See you very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.